In this video, I'll introduce the basic trigonometry functions and how they relate the lengths of the sides of a right triangle. Then I'll extend those concepts to talk about using trig functions to project points on the perimeter of a circle onto a set of rectangular coordinates. This will lead us to using trig functions to convert from polar to rectangular coordinate systems. Trigonometric functions relate the lengths of the sides of a right triangle. So the first thing I'll do is to provide some terms relative to right triangles. A right triangle has one interior angle which is 90 degrees, or a right angle. Right angles are often denoted by this little square. The hypotenuse of a right triangle is the side of the triangle that's opposite to the right angle. This will always be the longest side of the triangle. Trig functions are defined in terms of the other two angles and the lengths of the sides of the triangle. In order to keep track of which side we're talking about, we define the sides relative to whether they are adjacent to or opposite to the angle. For example, this side is adjacent to this angle theta. The adjacent side touches the angle. The side opposite to the angle theta does not touch theta. If we change the angle that we're interested in to this angle up here, the roles of the opposite and adjacent sides switch. The hypotenuse is always just the hypotenuse. Trigonometric functions relate the ratios of the lengths of the sides of a right triangle. I'll call the length of the hypotenuse h. For this angle, x is the length of the side adjacent to theta, and y is the length of the side opposite to the angle theta. Keep in mind that in the definitions I'll provide next, these lengths are based on the angle I'm looking at. The first trig function I'll talk about is sine. The sine of an angle is the ratio of the length of the side opposite to the angle to the length of the hypotenuse. Sine is abbreviated as SIN, and for this angle theta, sine is Y divided by H. The cosine of an angle is the ratio of the length of the side adjacent to the angle divided by the length of the hypotenuse. Cosine is abbreviated as cos, and cos of theta, where this is theta, is x divided by h. The last trigonometric function I'll talk about in this video is the tangent. The tangent is the ratio of the length of the side opposite to the angle to the length of the side adjacent to the angle. Tangent is abbreviated as TAN, and for this angle, tangent of theta is y divided by x. If you have trouble remembering the definitions of sine, cosine, and tangent, there's a fairly common mnemonic. It's SOKOTOA. The sine is the opposite side over the hypotenuse, the cosine is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse, and the tangent is the opposite side over the adjacent. SOKOTOA. There are a few comments I want to make before we move on to defining trig functions in terms of a unit circle. Trig functions are ratios between the lengths of the sides of a triangle, which can also be expressed in terms of percentages. For example, if the sine of an angle is 0.5, the length of the opposite side to that angle is 50% of the length of the hypotenuse. The units of angles are expressed either in degrees or radians. The argument to a trig function, theta, should have no units. Radians have no units. So strictly speaking, mathematically, units of angles should be in radians. There are two pi radians in one revolution. However, angles can often be expressed more conveniently in degrees. Degrees are a somewhat arbitrary designation. What makes them particularly nice to work with is that they're defined so that there are 360 degrees in one revolution. 360 degrees is divisible by lots of integers. It can be divided by 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and products of any of these values and still result in an integer. One revolution has two pi radians, which equals 360 degrees. We'll use both degrees and radians as arguments in this class. Now let's talk about defining trigonometric functions in terms of a point that lies on a unit circle centered at the origin of a rectangular coordinate system. A unit circle has a radius of 1, and its center is at the intersection of the x-y axes. If I choose an arbitrary point on this circle, I can define a right triangle based on this point. 
The hypotenuse of the triangle will be the radius of the circle, so the hypotenuse length is 1. I'll define the angle between the positive x-axis and the hypotenuse as theta. The cosine of theta equals x over h, so the x position of this point is h times cosine of theta. Since the hypotenuse is 1 for a point on the unit circle, x location of this point is just the cosine of theta. Likewise, the sine of theta is equal to y over the hypotenuse. So y equals the hypotenuse length times the sine of theta. The hypotenuse length is 1, so the y value of this point is the sine of theta. Next, I'll do some examples of specific points around this unit circle. While looking at these examples, keep in mind that the x value of a point is equal to the cosine of theta, and the y value of a point is the sine of theta. First, I'll look at cases where the angle theta is multiples of 90 degrees from the positive x-axis. So the points I'll be talking about are on the x and y axes. If theta is equal to 0 degrees, the point on the unit circle is on the positive x-axis. That means that the x value is the same as the radius of the circle, and the y value is 0. So the sine of 0 degrees is 0, and the cosine of 0 degrees is positive 1. The next case is theta equals 90 degrees. Since 360 degrees equals 2 pi radians, theta is equal to pi over 2 radians. For this angle, the point is directly on the positive y-axis, so the y value is 1 and the x value is 0. This means that the sine of 90 degrees is 1 and the cosine of 90 degrees is 0. If I increase the angle by another 90 degrees, the angle is 180 degrees or pi radians. The x value for this condition is negative 1 and the y value is 0. So the sine of 180 degrees is 0, and the cosine of 180 degrees is negative 1. Adding another 90 degrees gives an angle of 270 degrees, or 3 pi over 2 radians from the positive x-axis. At this angle, the point on the unit circle has an x value of 0 and a y value of negative 1. So the sine of 270 degrees is negative 1, and the cosine of 270 degrees is 0. If I increase the angle by another 90 degrees, theta becomes 360 degrees, and the point on the unit circle gets back to the same point as theta equals 0 degrees. The sine and cosine functions repeat themselves every 360 degrees, or 2 pi radians. Next, I'll look at points that are at 90 degree angles from an angle of 45 degrees from the positive x-axis. But before I do that, I want to talk about what we can expect for the x and y values at those points. The Pythagorean theorem says that for a right triangle, the square of the length of the hypotenuse equals the sum of the squares of the other two sides of the triangle. In the special case where the triangle has two equal sides, the angle theta is 45 degrees. If this triangle is inscribed on a unit circle, the hypotenuse length is 1, and both of the sides must have lengths that equal 1 over the square root of 2. Since 1 over square root 2 squared is 1 half, and 2 times 1 half is equal to 1. To double check this, if you use your calculator to find the sine and cosine of 45 degrees, you should get 1 over square root 2 for both values, which in decimal form is about 0.7071. Now let's look at some examples with sine and cosine values that are based on 45 degree angles. I'll start with theta equal to 45 degrees, which is pi over 4 radians. Both the x and y values in this case are the same, and they're both equal to 1 over the square root of 2. So both the sine and the cosine of 45 degrees are 1 over root 2. Adding 90 degrees to 45 gives 135 degrees. The x value is now negative, so the cosine of 135 degrees is negative 1 over square root of 2. The sine of 135 degrees is still positive. When theta is 225 degrees, the x and y values are now both negative 1 over square root of 2, so the sine and cosine of 225 degrees are both negative 1 over square root of 2. Finally, when theta is equal to 315 degrees, the sine of theta is negative 1 over square root of 2, and the cosine of theta is positive 1 over square root of 2.
Now let's generalize what we'd expect the signs of the trigonometric functions to be in the different quadrants of a rectangular coordinate system. In the first quadrant, both the x and y values are positive. That means that the sine and the cosine functions in this quadrant will both be positive, since sine corresponds to the y value of a unit circle and cosine corresponds to the x value. Since the tangent is y divided by x, and both x and y are positive, tangent will also be positive in this quadrant. In the second quadrant, x is negative and y is positive, so the cosine is negative and the sine is positive. The tangent is the ratio of a positive to a negative number, so the tangent will be negative in this quadrant. In the third quadrant, both the sine and the cosine are negative. The ratio of two negative numbers is a positive number, so the tangent will be positive. In the fourth quadrant, x is positive and y is negative, so the cosine is positive and the sine is negative. Tangent will be a negative number in this quadrant. Finally, I'll summarize a few properties of trig functions that are worth remembering. As I've already mentioned, Adding 360 degrees, or 2 pi radians, to an angle doesn't actually change the angle, so it doesn't change the value of the trig function. That means that adding integer multiples of 360 degrees, or 2 pi radians, also doesn't change the angle or its trig functions. Angles can also be expressed as either positive or negative values. So this angle theta is the same as this negative angle phi. Changing the sign on this angle theta results in the same x value, so the cosine of negative theta is the same as the cosine of theta. The y value, however, changes sign, so the sine of theta is equal to the negative of the sine of negative theta. The last thing I want to do is revisit the vector decomposition problem I did in the introductory video on trigonometry. In that problem, we were pushing on a block that's on some surface with a force that was at an angle theta from the surface. We wanted to write the equations that would let us determine the acceleration of the block A. First, I'll isolate all the parameters I'm interested in. The acceleration and the applied force are just as they were before. The friction force, F sub B, opposes the motion, and it's just the friction coefficient, B, times the normal force between the block and the surface, which I've labeled as F sub N. Now I need to define a coordinate system. Most of the forces and the acceleration are either perpendicular to or parallel to the surface. So I'm going to choose those directions as my X and Y coordinates. My defined coordinate system also specifies which directions I consider to be positive. The only parameter that's not in either a purely x or a purely y direction is the applied force. So I'll use trigonometry to determine the components of the applied force in the x and the y directions, as shown here. Now my problem is simple. I just apply Newton's second law independently in the x and the y directions to determine my unknown values. Those are some basic definitions and properties relative to trigonometric functions. In the next video, I'll introduce inverse trigonometric functions. After that, I'll revisit using trig functions and inverse trig functions to convert back and forth between rectangular and polar coordinate systems.